The man swung his sword towards the monster. Meanwhile, the young man was having dinner and the girl next to him witnessed the battle. The young man asked the man if he said the monster meat tasted good. The man agreed and turned away. The hero shouted at him to stop eating and help him defeat the monster's attack, which caused an explosion with his magical abilities. The hero's words overcame the monster and the man admitted to being their first enemy, ending in the same way as this monster. The hero demanded to cook the food the man requested. What was the girl's reaction when she approached him and called him uncle? She said fighting with a blind person was bad coming from a girl. She said he was sweet, even when he was angry. The hero looked at his hands and thought he had done his job well. The fighting hero thought this was the reason he was called to this world. The knights shouted that he was the one who did it. The man turned towards the princess and said he had overcome it. The girl replied that she had successfully summoned them. Five people were sitting in a circle under the gaze of the people surrounding them from all sides. The man asked Chika if she was okay, and he asked Taishi where they were. Taishi replied that she didn't know, and called Shuri and Shinobu. Shinobu responded, and Shuri said she was fine. The princess warmly welcomes and expresses gratitude for their response to the call. The princess says that his majesty will clarify all the details and asks them to leave. The girls look at each other, and the hero walks behind them, pondering the situation. He looks towards the knights and wonders what kind of place this is. The hero believes that they are truly in another world, which delights the king. The king says that they are confused because they were suddenly pulled out, but asks them to calm down so he can explain everything to them. The king says that he is the ruler of the country where Victoria's is located, the world of Adia. Rudolph says that she is a Lilith princess. Rudolf Strauss explains that the reason they need a hero is for Victoria's safety. They need to destroy the demons. He explains that Idea is inhabited by human, demon, beast, and spirit races. But tensions between the two races are high. The king tells them that the demon king wants to destroy humanity. Princess Lilith says that they are blessed with high magical powers and physical abilities, making them unmatched in battle. The princess says that they have no chance of winning, so they use summoning magic. She also says that such miracles come with risks because humans do not possess magical powers. The princess acknowledges that she is glad everything worked out this time. The king replies that he has three daughters, two of whom tried to perform the ritual, but one of them died, and the other is in a coma. The hero wonders if he sacrificed his daughter. Taishi wonders if they can protect their country's people if they face that demon. The king answers that everything is true and says it is according to the fourth document. The hero is here. He looks closer and notices the fifth sentence the king said has dissolved, but report it there are five of them here. The princess assumes that they are all heroes, with their statistics appearing in front of the heroes. They read the headline saying, they are heroes. The princess explains to them that the words and symbols are deciphered according to their spelling in their world. She says this is done to facilitate their communication. The king turns to the hero asking what is written on it. The hero announces that he is indeed not a hero. The king and princess are horrified. The king asks who he is if not a hero. The hero announces that he is an innocent bystander. The princess is shocked and the king asks Taishi again. He says everything is clear. He announces that the hero came when they were talking in another class. The hero claims that everything is true and he is just an ordinary person, but he accidentally contacted this person. He says that in other words, only four things should have been summoned to this world, and he has done it. It has nothing to do with the current situation. He asks the princess how they are doing to fix it. The hero looks at the heroes, claiming that they were also summoned only for their benefit. He said he was so sure that their family was very worried about them. The man asked if they weren't classmates. The hero asked if he wanted to say that this was only about school and claimed that they hadn't talked since they experienced the same thing. The hero class convinced the king that they only needed four, so he had no connection to it. The king wondered who he would do. The hero asked the king if he could return to his world. The man replied that the document said that the demon king knew the miracle of returning. The man stated that they needed to take the demon king as soon as possible.
The hero wondered why he had to be expelled. The king nervously answered everything correctly. The man said it belonged to their great country, and they would definitely like it here. The girl admitted that she was also a little worried. The princess of their family, Lilith, said there was no need to worry about what Lilith said. We said that all signs of their existence had been erased from their original world. The character asked her again in horror. The princess reassured them by saying that this was the work of a spell, and if it was returned, everything would be back to normal. The hero assumed that everything told to them was a lie because they had to persuade them to help in any way. The hero realized that he wouldn't be able to return to his world now and decided that he didn't mind. He remembered moments from life in that world. The hero apologized, saying he would go his own way. He immediately refused, claiming he had no obligation to the country. So he didn't need to fight because he wasn't a superhero like them. He noticed that this world was very different from his own and asked the king if it wouldn't be a problem for him to spend his time as he pleased. The hero said goodbye to his classmates, but he shouted at him to wait. He grabbed the hero's hand and asked him how he could call himself a man. He said that the people of this country had bowed their heads in hope for them. She asked the hero if he thought it was at least worth trying to help them a little. Hero released his hand and replied that he didn't think so. He was shocked by his words, and Chica urged him to let her convince him that they didn't need him. He explained that it might look like a game, but it was still reality, meaning he actually had to risk his life. She said they were all heroes, but Okamura was an ordinary hero that he should consider what he was now. Taishi agreed to do everything on his own. The hero replied that he wanted it. They were lucky. Then Lilith ran towards the hero and said that she was very sorry. The hero told her not to worry and left. As the hero was walking around the city, he decided that first he needed to gather information using BASIC from the RPG. He looked at his statistics, paying attention to the magic words. He realized that he didn't know what type of unlimited magic it was and decided he would find out secretly. He thought he needed money to start, remembering that one way to make money in an RPG is to search through other people's homes, but he decided that sounded dangerous. He thought of another way to defeat monsters or complete hero quests, thinking about what it meant that he had to join a hero guild. He stared at him and assumed he was a fortune teller. The hooded man asked if he wanted to know his fate. The hero replied that he didn't have any money. The old woman laughed and said she wanted to ask him something. The old woman pointed at him and said that he came from another world. She asked if she was a true hero. She asked again, and the old woman laughed, telling him not to make that face. She had discovered her worst secret hero and decided that she was not interested in what she predicted. The hero sat down and thought that she was right to suspect that he came from another world. According to her, this old woman could give good advice. And besides, if her wealth told him, it was some kind of miracle that he had more reasons to listen to her predictions. The teller was surprised and told him that he had a strange fate star. The hero asked why it was strange. And the old woman explained to him that it was in everyone's heart. There is a star with its color, shape, and intensity of light, depending on the person. She said its color was dark blue, which suppressed the glowing red color that emanated from his stomach. Its shape was a perfect representation of a circle. The hero acknowledged it and said that he had never met such a strong star, although he had seen many of them. The old woman said that he had already found his new wings, and they would grow strong, wide and warm to everyone and anyone looking for such wings. The hero lightly reached out to stop her, saying it was not necessary. He admitted that he preferred to be a loner. The old woman replied that this was just one of the possibilities for the future hero in unlimited numbers. He thanked her for the information and said goodbye. She replied that it was not worth it because she was happy to meet a man, a sidelight she had never seen before, a long time ago. The old woman said it once when she was very young. She met an interdimensional explorer who looked like that. The hero was shocked and realized that this was not the first time someone had experienced coming to this country from another world. The fortune teller said that it always happened here, so let him stop by if he needed anything, except next time he had to pay. 
The hero went to the guild and looked around, wondering what kind of world this game was. An employee of the guild approached him and thanked him for his belongings. She said that his referral for a new task was ready, so she returned his multi-passport. The employee informed him that if there were no problems, the reason for canceling the task, he would have to pay a cancellation fee of 10,000 riggen and asked him to remember this. He read his task about collecting lottery plants and decided that if he failed, he would have more problems than just a lack of money. The girl asked if he knew what a lottery plant looked like, and he answered that he didn't know. The employee was looking for a lottery plant in a book, and the hero was losing patience. The guild employee warned the hero to be careful, as the notification was like a statistical window that he could manifest and make it disappear, and he thought it was convenient. The hero collected a bag of lottery plants. The hero thought this task was easier than he thought, and decided to check his statistics window. The hero said that he understood what magic meant, but he wondered what the broken inscription at the very end meant. He remembered the fortune teller's words that magic came from blood. So when he used magic, he had to concentrate on its flow. He understood that it was time to write symbols and asked what he should write. The hero wrote a symbol on the rock, which means splitting the inscription and starting to shine, and an explosion occurred. The rock split. The powerful young hero approached it. He examined the rock and said, This is incredible but it has been split in half. The rock was restored, and the hero looked at his finger and said, This is a cheat, and it's even better than the hero imagined. He asked his interlocutor again, and he answered that the prophet said it was a miracle. The uncertain origin is the unique thing he wants to ask about, but the hero interrupts him and asks what he means by mentioning his unique magic. The old woman answered, This magic is powerful, but only a few people possess it. She explained that one of the reasons is that many magic holders cannot control it. She added that they are dying because of the setback, and the hero is surprised. He realizes that this is the cause of the death of the first two princesses. The old woman says that they suffer setbacks because they don't understand it enough. The hero asks if he will become a first-class magician if he learns the magic of supernatural power. According to his knowledge, she says yes. He is very grateful to the old woman because thanks to him, he can be cautious with his magic. The young man realizes that the two uses have eliminated half of the parliament members, and therefore his body has become heavier. He assumes that he is at a high level of MP and is an advantage for the hero traveler. He thinks this is a good thing, but it means that in normal conditions, careless use can be dangerous. He grabbed his bag and said that since he was at level one then with his maximum MP, he could use it four times, and decided that he needed to swing the hero faster. Hearing a rustling and looking around, worried if he had been seen, he believed that if the king knew everything he wanted to be in trouble, there was a slime next to him that he quickly recognized. The slime attacked the hero, but he managed to dodge it, asking if he should fight. He stood up and said that in reality, it was very painful. He looked at his stats panel and realized that he had lost 3 GP. The hero realized that if he was hit seven more times, he would die. The slime had already attacked him, unless the young man said he wouldn't give up so easily. The young man used the magic words activating it. There was a big explosion and the hero's fire blazed. Seeing the location of the explosion and surprised by it, he could create something out of nowhere. He said he got something amazing. He said he checked his range by writing a news on the field and decided it was time to go back. The hero decided to watch the experience when he saw it was his experience. It was two. He decided that next time he would kill monsters without using magic heroes. Seeing his soup and thinking that his food had finally arrived, he remembered the extraordinary seafood noodles that attracted him. He calmly tasted his noodles and opened his eyes in surprise, saying the broth was full of seafood but it slides smoothly down your throat and quickly he tries the hero's noodles, feeling like he's been kissed by a fish. He realizes that it's the hero fish and understands that this is indeed seafood noodles, and you can get addicted to it. He leaves the cafe and reflects that his HP and MP have fully recovered, and there's an unusual lightness in his body. The hero decides it's time to find a hotel for the night, 
and start focusing on making money and leveling up tomorrow. One day in the dark forest, he chops down a slime. The slime spreads, and the hero receives a notification that he's reached level three. He decides that he's skilled at swinging at someone hiding in a tree, looking towards the hero who says there's only slime in the forest and not the goblin he needs. He says he's used to holding weapons, but he's bored with slime. Suddenly, someone attacks him from above. The hero manages to dodge and says the distance is close. The goblin stands in front of him and the hero says that he has appeared. He apologizes to him and tells him to make it his first move. He looks at the monster's body and claims that it's not fun. The crowd of monsters approaches him and the young man realizes that they have found him through the sounds. The hero decides that they are indeed just checking something and the monster attacks him. The hero uses magic words and writes a needle symbol on the floor, piercing the monster. The hero saw the slain monster and said that this was not a sight for the faint-hearted. He claimed that they were indeed monsters, but such massacres still happened. The dreadful hero looked at his trembling hands and said that he always considered himself less sensitive to others. The monster approached him, and the hero said that now he understood that he just had to do it until he got used to it. He ordered them to attack him until he got used to killing. In the guild, a bag fell on the table with a loud noise. The hero asked the girl for an evaluation of the twenty-two-fingered goblin. The girl admitted that she was surprised by it. She was able to kill so many goblin heroes, asked her to evaluate it as soon as possible. The young man thought about which quest he should take tomorrow, deciding that he needed to think about his actions in response to other monsters. The hero bought a new weapon, found some plants to fight against insect monsters, and brought everything to the guild. He was already level 10 and had a rank in the guild. The girl said Okamura was a rising star. Her companion asked her if she was very proud of it. The girl who noticed it had left the other girl who called her cool, and they bid her farewell together. The girls discussed where he came from because he had quite unusual hero clothes, claiming that if he kept working in Victoria's, then the king could know about him and could say that because he was so strong. He is no different from the next hero. In the morning, with his new armor, he continues his journey. He wonders where he should go next. The hero reaches a village and looks at the map, thinking about staying overnight because his journey is still far from over. The young man walks past the village and notices that the locals are wary of him and believe that he is not like the other wanderers. A little girl asks him if he is an adventurous hero, staring at him before turning and leaving. The girl shouts at him not to ignore her. The hero calls her a naughty child and asks her what she needs. The girl shouts at him not to call her that and asks why he came and tells him not to ignore her. The hero answers that it doesn't matter and calls himself a naughty hero, explaining that he is mischievous and asking what's wrong with calling him that. She tells him not to call her that and shouts that all adventurers are greedy and pathetic. She tells him that she is herself and asks him not to compare her to others because it's so annoying. The girl asked if he would disturb the village hero hearing the voice and turned around to see the man lying on the ground. The man shouted that if she messed with them here, he would kill her. The girl said that these people are adventurers who recently came to the village and took whatever food they liked and did whatever they wanted. The hero said he understood. He was worried that other adventurers might harm the village too. She asked the hero if he knew how to fight because he had a weapon and asked him to help them. He said he was an adventurer and could fight, but not a law enforcer, and if she wanted justice, then let him go and find the hero. The girl said she didn't like the way he said it. The man turned to Coco, telling him to stop. Her father said that what the man said was all fine. A hero who helps people for free, like from fairy tales. There is no hero who says it exactly like that. And besides, they should contact the guard with problems like that. A man replied that many people want to do it, but these people steal documents on land rights and the people cannot do anything about them. The hero claimed that they pay the price for their carelessness and told them to face their own problems. The girl said that she could also help them. The hero replied that if she wanted to, she could work for him and let him pay her the appropriate price. The girl was surprised by the question asked. Once again, she ran to the bandits and her father shouted that she couldn't go there. 
He wanted to chase her, but because his leg was broken, he wouldn't be able to catch up. Able to follow her, the man turned to the hero asking if he would help if they paid him. The man asked his friend how long he would eat the bandit who told him to hurry up when a stone hit his temple. Coco, who threw the stone, shouted at him and his friend left the village. The man asked him if he wanted to die and swung his sword. He didn't have time to attack because there was someone stretching a sword in front of him. He stood in horror and Coco was shocked. The hero tells the girl to wake up and asks her why he helped. The hero answers that he was paid so he would help. The bandit asks the hero who he is, and he answers that he doesn't have to answer. The hero says he will destroy him and attacks. The bandit notices that the hero quickly hits him with his sword, and he doesn't have time to avoid it. The bandit says that this is impossible and falls to the ground. The hero claims that he didn't think it was anything special for a moment. The bandit gets out of the house and asks why his friend is on the ground. The hero hurts him with his sword but realizes that he is wearing armor hero. He steps back, thinking that he is wearing protective armor. He tears his t-shirt and shouts, daring him. The man tells the hero that he will turn him into minced meat. The hero kicks his leg, but there is armor there too. The hero wonders if he is wearing a complete set of armor. He activates the power of his words and tells him to stand up, and steam starts flowing behind the bandit. It is said to be hot on his back, and steam comes out of the man's writing. The man screams that he is sexy. The hero writes a new word that strengthens and punches the man's face. The villagers start applauding that the bandit has been defeated, and the hero receives the notification. He thinks that for people like them, he gains more experience. Coco's father asks him if he is an extraordinary adventurous hero and asks if he assumes that these people are weak. The man replied no because they were known as sworn brothers, and they said that the bastard was inexperienced. The hero and the man looked at each other as the girl hit the boy saying that if he was strong, he should help them properly. The wandering hero replied that he had already done, so saying that he did not do it for free, explaining that this time he received a request from the parents. That's why he helped. The father Coco asked him if he wanted a rare book and delicious food as payment. He asked if he wanted to enter his shop before giving it to him. The man asked him to come to him. He took it out, drew his sword, and asked to accept it. The hero took it and examined it. While wondering, the man said his name. He asked the hero if he knew about the katana. The man explained that the katana was a weapon originally created by some of the beast kin. The man said no, unlike that, the sword created by humans was designed primarily for cutting force. Katana specialized in cutting victims into pieces using its speed. The man said that he guaranteed its sharpness, but the real value lay in how it penetrated. He claimed like that he smoothly pierced, just with his sword proving his strength. The man replied that he hid it in the basement because it belonged to him living in danger. The hero noticed that it was different from the others. He sold the hero, asked if he could really take it. The man replied that he regretted it, but the hero would need it more. He admitted that he really thought so when the hero answered that he exaggerated him because he didn't deal with those people because he wanted to do it himself. He noticed that the hero had left the store, so he called him. He took a bag from him and opened it. There were cakes inside the bag. He turned the cakes and asked how they were made. The young man said that this was the payment he wanted to get from the naughty boy, and the girl was happy. She asked about him, but he didn't listen to me and asked again. The girl demanded to mention his name. The young man answered that he was a hero named Hiro Okamura. Okamura looked at his panel in surprise that he got two levels. He said that both things were useful and influenced his experience. He looked at the statistics and his claims were truly amazing. Many things had been improved. He said that apparently it was called a traveler's advantage because he wasn't even a hero but he was still lucky. He noticed that he had a new magic and decided to try it. He floated in the air and shot a word into the vase. The flower vase started floating in the air. He lay on the bed with a book in his hand. He remembered that he received a book about world history and as an addition, a good weapon. The next morning, his father said that he didn't think so and would leave without saying anything. Coco held the cake that he said he made them again. 
The man said that they would definitely meet again. Coco smiled and said yes, he said they had a new relic from the hero, in the castle of Victoria's. Someone said that his shoulders were numb. The knight greeted the heroes by saying that they had worked hard and were used to everything. Hero saw berries near him. He said he was hungry and should buy more food. As he approached the berries and wondered if they were edible, he pulled out the berries from the ground, and the hero screamed as the roots of the plants were escaping from the animals and monsters. He asked, who would think that this was a plant about misfortune? He remembered an incident in the guild where a guild employee said that if he had the chance to visit the mountains, he should be wary of the Torchu disaster plants. The hero asked him what it was. The girl explained to him that they made screams and pulled the hero's monster to escape, and thought about how he could become a joyful hero hiding in the forest. He said that he would be able to find out, but suddenly a number of monsters jumped out from nowhere, making him scared. Suddenly he smelled it and ran towards it. He went to the riverbank, where he saw a bonfire, where fish were being fried. He said it was time to refresh himself and his desire to eat fish. Someone fell on top of him, screaming for him to let go. The man pointed at him and said it was stealing food from Arnold, which was unforgivable, and asked him to identify himself. The hero asked if it was the fish. The young man asked if he would give it to him. He said he was hungry. Arnold said he was very noisy and asked how his parents raised him. The hero asked if he would give it or not and added that he was indeed tired. The man got angry and asked who was bothering him here. The girl who saw all this called him uncle. He asked if he was okay. Arnold asked Muir to wait a moment. He said that he would teach that scoundrel a lesson and knock some sense into his head with his fist. Hero of Love stated that he wouldn't do it, taking everything and asking to share with Arnold. Little Arnold asked if he had never been there before and if he was taught to talk to others at all. The hero asked what the problem was and stated that he wouldn't compromise with that man anymore, who attacked him and said that he was not in a position to say such things. Arnold grabbed his sword and the hero wanted him to take his katana. Suddenly they heard strange noises and turned around to see a monster standing near Muir, growling loudly while the girl stared at it in horror and couldn't move. The monster reached out to grab her, but Arnold shielded her with himself and cut off its paw. Arnold swore as he noticed three more monsters in front of him, thinking that there were four barbarian bears. He wondered what to do and whether to use them. The hero asked the man if there were only fish there. He answered that there were only fish and asked what difference it made to him. The hero said he had no reason for it and told him to stay again so that he would leave them. Arnold noticed that his claw had just been cut off, destroying the bonfire where the fish was. That's where he came from, said the hero when he arrived there. He seemed to be struggling but let him try there. Arnold asked him to wait and said it's because he knew it was difficult for him. He would help him. The hero replied that he refused. He added that he refused to give concessions if he had more fish for him. The man swore to him Arnold realized that he couldn't protect Muir from four bears. At once he shouted that it was already like this he used his last trump card. The hero heard the man say that he would share some of his meat with him, so let him help him. The hero approached him and asked him what he was shouting that this was the first class of his meat melted on the tongue and tasted delicious right now. One of the monsters reached Muir and wanted to eat her. The hero used paralysis that prevented him from moving, so he let Muir go. Muir falls and Arnold ran to catch her but clearly didn't have time. The hero said he caught her, which the girl saw in amazement. The young man told her that if she wanted to stand on her own feet, then let her down if not she would end up. In the middle of the fight, the hero turned to the man and told him to do it, gather these creatures into a pile. Arnold told the hero that if he wanted, he could also get addicted, then let him back. The hero waited for Arnold to do his bidding. Arnold is getting ready to use his technique, spinning his sword and using explosive wind claws, gathering all the bear heroes together. He uses his magical words and extends his sword, piercing through four bears at once with his extended sword. The young man reflects that this is what is expected from a special katana, in stabbing almost effortlessly. When he knows he is stabbed, Arnold asks the hero how he is doing. The hero replies that he is safe nearby. Then the young man asks him if he doesn't need to worry anymore. The safety of this little man, the man starts screaming, asking where he is.
Arnold answers that he is here and comes out from his hiding place. He asks if it's over, but Arnold runs towards him, grabbing his shoulder and asking if he is hurt. The girl says he's not, and Arnold calms down, relieved. The hero tells him to keep his promise. Arnold asks which promise he is talking about. The situation escalates, and the hero grabs Arnold's katana, asking which promise he is talking about. The hero gets angry, shouting that he was just kidding. He apologizes to the girl, saying he didn't mean to force him to eat the meat here. The girl replies that everything is fine, and that's how she saved him. He asked if it wouldn't be awkward to eat together with someone. Arnold and the hero saw Muir, who said that it was now possible to start eating. They both started eating and felt something extraordinary. The hero thought that the meat gradually melted on his tongue and completely disappeared. Arnold cried and asked the hero if it was worth killing for. He said it was the most delicious part of the animal. He also told Muir that the sauce was amazing. The hero asked if she made the sauce. The girl confusedly answered that she was the one who made it and explained that it was a special sauce made from fruit. After their lunch, the man asked the hero what his name was. The young man demanded that he mention his name first. The man replied that adventurer and cook were his names. Arnold heard that he was a cook and said it was obvious where he got the meat from. The girl said that she was just a supporting actress. The hero asked if she had been kidnapped. Arnold angrily stood up and shouted that she hadn't. He explained that Muir came from the village he passed through and said that the rest was not important. He stated that she was now his daughter. Arnold asked who he was. The young man answered that he was Okamura, a hero and adventurer. Arnold exclaimed that the last part seemed like just his hobby. Arnold laughed and said that Muir's laughter was also incredibly funny. M stated that she wasn't little and she was already 12. Arnold claimed that anyone would faint if a food thief with bad behavior and even worse appearance appeared in front of them. He said that in order to protect the village, even garbage heroes are ready to eat, saying that he will truly lose his humanity. The hero with dignity asked if this is one of the jokes that are now popular among the beastmen. Arnold and Muir were surprised to hear this. Arnold grabbed his sword and asked him how he understood it. The hero pointed with his finger and said, Look over there. Arnold shifted his gaze and saw that Muir had a tail. The hero asked if this is one of the characteristics of beast men. Arnold said yes, and that Muir is a baby beast man. But he assured them that they didn't make a mistake. Arnold bowed and asked him not to tell anyone about this hero. He asked why he told others about it. He admitted that he didn't care if this baby is a beast man or a human hero, saying that instead of worrying about such a small thing, it's better to let him do something useful. He claimed that the fact that they live here doesn't change anything and asked if things like books and food are not more important. Arnold started laughing uncontrollably, and the hero told him not to laugh in front of him and threatened to stab him. Arnold said it's true and that there are people like him. He showed him his tale and stated that he is also a beast man. He told them that they will return to the Beastmen continent which is right across the border. The hero closed the book and remained silent. Arnold asked him if he was interested in why he didn't have ears. The young man said that his ears were stolen from him when he was still a servant. Arnold replied that someone his age might not know about it, because this custom has already been abolished. He said that people used it to create a system to oppress beastmen, and they would kidnap and carve a magical mark on their children and if they tried to refuse, it would cause them unbearable pain. He explained that his ears were cut off before being sold, because they caused trouble for him. Arnold said that his ears were prosthetic, made by a friend, and asked him if they looked like real heroes. He asked if it was easy to remove this mark, and if he managed to escape since then. Here, Arnold answered that the mark automatically disappears when the owner dies. He said he didn't do anything except that a sympathetic person saved them. The hero stated that instead he would seek revenge on others in the most sophisticated way. Arnold said he was happy now, and that's what mattered most. He apologized for forgetting to ask what he was doing in a place like this. He asked the hero if he had any kind of duty. The young man answered that he crossed the border just like them. Arnold asked him why a man would go to the continent of beastmen. He replied that it was because he wanted to, 
and because the world is in chaos now. The legendary hero was called by a girl who referred to him as Short and asked if he would wear this hat. The girl remained silent and hesitantly asked if he wanted it. The hero stared at her and thought that it was a good sign that he had succeeded in meeting the Beastmen soon after coming to this world. Arnold told him to stop talking and claimed that fate had brought them together. He offered to go with them and since then they headed to the same place, convincing them that he would guide them. The hero said and got up, saying that he should have done it politely, asking her to follow him. Arnold admitted that he was starting to become interested and asked him what his level was. The hero asked why Arnold was interested in this and claimed that his physical characteristics were quite tall for a human and his thirst for killing was considerable, but he couldn't help but think about it. He lacked experience. The hero asked what Arnold's level was and decided to check it now with his magic. Arnold answered that he had a level 31 hero. Reading Arnold's characterization and realization, the hero realized that he was not lying. He read the title and thought it was true. The hero blandly said that he had a level 23 and was sure that he still couldn't fully trust them, but he traveled with them for the time being. Arnold exclaimed that he was better off after everything was said and done. The hero reassured him that not all of his levels were everything. They walked to the village and were confused to say that there was no stone left from the village. Arnold asked the villager if something happened. The man replied that it was just because of some beastkin went wild. Arnold asked why some beastkin were rampaging. The man said they were fighting with a group of strange people because they wanted to capture them and tell them to obey. He said it was an unreasonable request, but they immediately attacked them when the beastmen refused. Arnold and Muir were frustrated sitting on a bed in the hero's hotel, reading a book in one bed and searching in their bed. Arnold started shouting, saying there was nothing he could do while sitting here looking grumpy because it wasn't his way. He claimed he was scaring the hero, who replied that he didn't care and asked him not to suddenly shout. He said so, almost ready to call the doctor and tell him he was crazy. Arnold laughed, saying it was for some reason, his frustration even refreshing today. The hero asked if he was a masochist, and the man told him to be quiet. Arnold asked if he wanted to say something. The hero replied that he just wanted to ask how fast they would reach the border, which the man said he didn't enter too hastily, and maybe it was worth slowing down. He suggested continuing in the same spirit and dealing with the issue. When they arrived, the hero asked if that was true because it was too optimistic. The man replied that he had a principle of not taking everything to heart. He assured me of that. He was in a completely different place when it came to Muir. And then he would destroy everything in his path. The hero asked if he was showing off his rank. The man shouted that it was not true what Muir said, that the hero was rude, and she was no longer a little girl who Arnold thought was sweet. Now, the next day, Arnold said he wanted to sell his loot from the monsters before they left. There was no fellowship in this village, said the hero. They already had enough money and asked why he didn't just throw it away if it was hindering. The man asked why such wastefulness because the victims were just frog needles. And that's how Arnold was expensive. He said that if they had money, they could buy rare materials and books that he really liked. The hero asked if they would stand here and chat for a long time or go to the main store. The man said to listen to him. The man asked if he was selling it here. The seller said no matter what he said, if he didn't have them, he wouldn't be able to sell them. The customer said he was in trouble, and because he ran the main store, he must have items like the frog bee needles. Arnold asked if he needed the frog bee needles. The man replied that it belonged to his daughter, bitten by a poisonous insect, so he needed it. Arnold said it was the case, but the hero interrupted him, offering money for rare materials, food, and books. The man said he wasn't trying to take everything for free, but would buy other items for them as a thank you. Arnold apologized to him, but the man said it wasn't worth it. He convinced her and daughter to be happy about this and asked them to consider it from their perspective. He shouted at them that the next time they meet, they will drink together. The hero said that this person is fair like a typhoon, and Arnold agreed. They went to the square and discussed what they should eat. They decided to stay here overnight. Arnold thought they weren't here, but the hero reported that there was noise inside the square. Arnold asked if there was a performance there. 
They approached the crowd and Arnold was surprised to see a group of people catching the beastmen. Arnold thought they were even included in it. He told the hero to get out of here. The man shouted at everyone not to move because from now on they will take anyone who tries to escape. The man said that there are beastmen in this city and they came to catch them. The hero noticed a book on the train that he saw the guard was disturbed by. He decided to take a look at it. He thought about how he could reach it because he wanted to read it. The guards asked people to take off their hats. Arnold told Muir that everything was fine. The guard released the other man and approached Arnold with a stern look. Then the blue-haired man repeated what he said, took off his hat, and urged Arnold to do it quickly. Arnold realized that he would have to fight someone. They shouted at him to let the kid go at least. The guard told him to shut up, and the guards were ordered to report that they had found them. The two men said it must be them, and he ordered them to stand up, saying that they would kill them now. Arnold wondered why this had to happen. The boy said that this girl had a tail and pointed at Muir. The guards and heroes turned their attention to her. The guard told them not to move and move towards them. Muir apologized to Arnold, but he told her it wasn't her fault and they had to deal with that man. The blindfolded man said that protecting beastmen was not the best thing to do. He didn't want to die. Arnold wondered if this was their leader. According to him, he had a hero with a completely different level. He thought about what he should do because his parents hadn't found the answer yet, and he was clearly going to fight this buggy and the others. He thought that if they were carefree, he could join them and do it. But surrounded by so many people, there was no chance to use his magic words. Arnold asked the man what he was talking about because he really didn't care if he was human or beast man. The important thing was that they were going through it. The man answered that there were very few beast men, but that didn't mean they should be hated more than demons. He said their existence was disgusting. Arnold attacked him and told him to stop talking nonsense. The man defended himself by saying that he had already met Arnold. Arnold shouted that he would never forgive him. We called Arnold and he was arrested by another guard and taken somewhere. He called him tears and Arnold shouted for him to cry. The man punched Arnold and he lost consciousness. He said that he shouldn't waste his life like that if he was human and left the man pinned to put him in a cage and sent the mother and daughter there. Arnold wanted to stop them, but he couldn't even get to them. Arnold mentioned the appearance of his sworn hero in the Muir's hat and said he didn't like this attitude. Arnold shouted asking if two hours had passed. The hero claimed that he had slept too long. Arnold got up and left. The hero asked where he was going. Arnold answered that he was going to save Muir because if two hours had passed, they couldn't have gone far. He said to look for everything and he would find his hero. The hero believed that this was not the best effective way to do business. Arnold shouted and asked if he had a better plan. The hero asked to be released and punched Arnold in the stomach. The hero said he wouldn't do much if he could knock him down with one punch. Arnold said he knew, but even now Muir needed the hero's help. The hero asked him not to worry because they were still in town. Arnold was excited to ask if he was a real hero seriously, asking not to approach saying he would bump into him. He said there was a rumor that they met someone here, so they stayed on the east side of town maybe because that person hadn't shown up yet. Arnold wanted to go there, but the hero stopped him. Arnold asked him if he wanted to help. The hero would answer no, not like that, and he was only interested in their group, so he asked to talk about it. Arnold said why didn't he tell me anything? He asked how he planned to pay because dragging him looked like a dead frog all the way here, and he gave him information that Arnold said he would go to be brief, so let him listen carefully. He said that the organization called the Beast Human Cage, and its goal is to capture them or turn them into servants. He said they patrol the continent and will act according to principles. Arnold said he was caught once too, and that's when he was forced to be a servant. He said they were all strong, or should be strong enough to fight the Beast Men who are physically stronger than ordinary people. He asked the hero if he wasn't interested in anyone else, and what made him interested. This time the hero answered that he wasn't interested in them, but in the book. They held asking Arnold again, and the hero explained that they had a book on the train. But he couldn't do it outside the title. He muttered that they picked him up while traveling across the continent. He said he wanted to see them all. 
Arnold asked if he could go now. The hero thought that he could walk separately from them, but they could give him information about their continent. He also reflected that Arnold's cooking was really surprising. Arnold asked what's next. He said it needs to be done quickly. The hero thought it wouldn't be easy to help them, but if he stole the book under the people, his conscience would become clear because they were hunting. The hero beastman suggested Arnold to steal the book. He agreed, and then corrected himself by saying that he wanted the same thing first, crying in one of the carts. He remembered Arnold and wondered why he always obstructed him. He apologized to him and suggested that it would be better if he wasn't there. He heard the girl asking her mother if they would die. She asked her if the beastmen were really that bad, and if they just looked a little different from her. The mother apologized, saying that if she didn't insist on visiting this city at that time, nothing would have happened to the woman. She turned to Muir and said that she was very sorry because she got caught because of them. Muir answered that it wasn't their fault. The girl also apologized to her tissue, wiping her tears and thinking that she couldn't cry now. She believed that she had to repay her uncle's kindness. And if she said it would be better if she left, then she would be angry, and both her parents would be angry too. She explained that there was a hero in the city who would save them. She invited them to believe in him. She asked if Arnold would come to rescue her. She said the hero might come or not. They ran to Arnold for help, and the hero got the man book, then greeted them, saying they hadn't seen each other for a long time. The man assured that he always did his duty, convincing me that formality was unnecessary. Mr. Apuro asked if he could accept it. He briefly looked at the requested items. He asked him to go to the train. He opened it and showed him the people sitting there. The man was happy and said, Such true beauty. He always satisfied with his work. He asked if this meant he was satisfied with the product. The man answered that he was always grateful. He claimed that in the end this was the only one. He asked to send his belongings to confirm the purchase. Arrow suddenly said he became a paper merchant. He didn't understand what was happening. The hero mentally told Arnold to do his best. Arnold approached them and told them to stand still. He drew his sword and announced that he had taken Muir back. He got angry when she recognized him. Arnold called out to Muir and she called out to him. They both shouted happily. Arnold turned to him and wagged his tail, indicating that he was a beast man. The members of the organization were shocked and couldn't believe it. He said he didn't have animal ears, but Arnold explained that they had been cut off. He thought he had caught their attention and pointed to his prosthetic ears, reflecting on the fact that everything relied on the hero at this moment. He sneaked into the hidden cart and thought that Arnold had done a great job with his magic. Everything was going according to plan. He found a book he wanted to read, which turned out to be a magical gourmet journey. He didn't think it was bad. He noticed another person who claimed to be the best beastman in the world. He asked if he needed a male beastman, but he replied that there were no buyers for male beastmen. If someone was to blame, let them blame themselves for being born as beastmen. Arnold said he wouldn't lose this time and ordered his subordinates to attack with fire magic. Arnold used his explosive wind claw skills to deflect their attacks. He held off all the fire strikes, but he said he seemed like he was already at his limit. Arnold asked for their opinion on how long he should stand still, but he asked what he was talking about. Arnold yelled that he was serious and attacked them, telling them to bite, but he asked if he would do it by crashing the train as well. Arnold used the explosive wind claw and threw it creating a huge tornado that engulfed the entire population of the waterfall and the train where Arnold stood amidst the destruction, sticking his sword into the ground and asking how they fell, saying he was surprised by how much power was left in him. Arnold was shocked that he completely refused to load the explosive wind claw and told him that he was not an ordinary person. Afterwards, he replied that it was understandable and said that he was just a barbaric beastman to only suck in his friends with a gust of wind. Arnold asked if he was blind. He didn't understand who he was talking about. Arnold explained that he didn't hurt any beastmen with his attack. He heard Muir calling Arnold a hero of the Muir, and a girl with her mother appeared nearby. The man-words witnessing the battle falling were unbelievable, 
and asked how they got it out of the train. He wondered who this boy was watching the hero. Arnold replied that he was also curious, but he suggests that they come back to this topic another time. Muir stands in front of Arnold and says it's now his turn to defend. He claims that just by looking at them, they disturb him and even send clients flying. He prepares to attack and says he will kill them all. He attacks them with a firearm, but Arnold manages to grab Muir and warns all the heroes of the danger of thinking like that. This man is not so easy. He decides to check his status, which is reflected in the fact that there is a difference of 27 levels. So he leads the old man to his nose, remembering that he told him to try and control himself. But now he is in a bad situation, the hero says. However, even here the weather is very hot. Everyone notices something, and Arnold's shout disturbs him. They look in his direction, and the hero sees ashes from his book falling next to him. He takes it in his hand, but it crumbles right in his hand. He looks at his empty hand and starts laughing hysterically as Arnold calls him a hero, staring at him and asking how dare he burn his books. He doesn't understand what he's talking about, and Arnold notices that this is not his hero who is standing ready to attack. And he asked if he was ready for the consequences, asked who he was talking about, using magic for speed to instantly appear by his side and attack him. The man said this person doesn't belong to them, swinging his sword towards him to attack him, but he dodged and came from behind to counterattack. He fell down and smiled, saying that he still found himself behind the hero, attacking him with all his might. The hero couldn't dodge the sword and fell to the ground, saying that he just got it back. He supported the hero, noticing his eyes without a bandage, wondering what was wrong with him. He asked if those ridiculous eyes bothered him, and he said he would never understand the pain and suffering when the beast man implanted it into him. Arnold was shocked when he asked if the beast men did it. His fall revealed that the suffering soon turned into hatred, and he attacked the hero. He fought with the young man, saying that he would never lose, and this is the simple reason why he would never forgive the beast men and hated them so much. He punched the hero's face with such force that he flew, and the hero realized that if this continued, he would quickly run out of HP. He said he didn't know what he was trying to do, but with his right eye, he could observe every movement of his opponent. The hero realized that his eyes not only enhanced his vision, but also his physical abilities. He admitted that he didn't think he was that strong. Falls wanted to kill the hero and said this was the end for him. Arnold asked why he did something really bad. He clarified that he had already told him, explaining that he hated them. The hero said he could tell where he came from because the hero used his magic to create light for the blind man. He screamed in pain as his eyes hurt from the hero's light words. He now owed it to his parents. He realized and opened his left eye, but the hero immediately attacked him. He punched him in the face, causing him to almost fall. His face was injured, and he said he had done it now to repay his debt. The man got angry and swore, shouting why he sided with the beastmen and whether he was human or not. He shouted that they were enemies and this was common sense. So let him listen. The hero replied that common sense meant nothing to him. He said he ruined his enjoyment. That's why he would face him. The beast man girl shouted that he should die and called him with strange eyes. Freak angrily asked what she said. The girl continued to scream that he was indeed ugly, but her mother tried to stop her. Then he said she seemed to want to die and attacked her with fire, but Muir managed to cover her with herself. As the hero pulled the girls out of the fire and said they were in the way, Muir noticed that his hand was burned and looked at him, pointing it out. The hero said he was only injured because of something trivial and ordered him to escape. The hero said he would protect these people because they were his clients. The man said so, starting to make him angry and noticing that he couldn't use his hand anymore. The hero laughed and his hand healed completely. He used his magic words to heal his hand and said he could now. He asks if this is true healing magic and if he is capable of using light magic without being one of the hero priests. The hero priest answers that he is able to think as he wishes. F says it's time to stop fooling around, and now he goes to hit him. He uses a fiery punch, and some fireballs fly towards their hero, exploding right next to him. Arnold and Muir scream at him. The hero is out of breath from the shock. And then he says he knows he will attack him again. Tell him to die. 
The hero recites a spell and rolls back to the floor. The man asks what he did to make his bullet disappear. The hero tells him to pay better attention to his feet. The hero writes glue on the floor and he doesn't understand what he's doing. He can't move and asks what it is. The hero explains if he can also use earth magic. The hero swings and says he wonders if that could be possible and slaps his face. The human trembles in pain when the hero says it is the first volume of the gourmet travel report across the continent. Falls doesn't understand what he's talking about. Arnold watches the hero continue to beat him, who says this is the second and third volume in the magic system. Arnold claims that he has an extraordinary simple interest in the book and decides that he will try to be more careful. He can't get up from his wound. He swears to create fire to attack him. The hero asks if it will happen coolly, facing a fire mage with his own element and using the magic words he writes, burn in the air and uses it on the waterfall. The hero says he must learn his lesson about who to choose as an opponent. Falls asks him to wait and asks who he is. The hero answers that he is a unique fraud. Falls, dying, says he will remember his face and looks at Arnold. And then Muir added that they also told Arnold that they needed to enter the city before the crowd of people ran in. The Beastman woman thanked them for saving her and asked how they could thank them. The heroes replied that she didn't need to because it was just part of their mission. Arnold thanked the heroes by saying that they truly helped. A young man answered that it was indeed much more important that they did not forget the beautiful materials. Arnold pondered what would happen if the heroes didn't help and wondered who he thought he had unusual physical abilities and strength for a human. He decided to ask what he was writing using it. The chubby man ran towards them, shouting for them to wait. He stated that he wouldn't let them leave. The man claimed that his beastman's den would bring reinforcements, and they wouldn't be able to escape. He said that this time they would help him by granting one last request, the chubby man request. The man who approached him was Arnold recognized him and was surprised to ask if he was sick. Rav grabbed the chubby man, telling him to listen. He said he was a divine and charming beautiful woman, a beautiful princess. He hit him and screamed that they were the dearest wife and daughter of everyone watching as the chubby man flew away from his blows. They must be surprised by this statement. A few weeks ago, a wounded man said he was confused. He saw a house in the middle of the forest and assumed he would rest there. He realized that he had lost consciousness and had already started stumbling. He heard someone asking his mother if he was okay, and the woman replied that they were doing everything they could to wake him up. The man didn't understand what was happening, and the woman asked if he was okay. The girl exclaimed that he had woken up. The man said that he then launched a vicious attack, and they got married. Arnold said he would never do it, thinking that there would never be someone who would offer such a thing to a beast man. Rav said he was still happy about it, and the girl replied that the hero saved them. She turned to Muir and said that the hero's brother really came, just like Muir said. Muir replied that it was true, but he thought he wasn't referring to the hero but was talking about his uncle. Rav said it was him again, thanking the three of them and being interested in their names. Arnold gave his name, saying that the girl's name was Muir and her antisocial personality was shameless. The young hero thought it wasn't his problem how Arnold was presented and rudely turned around because of a loud noise and asked what it turned out to be. It was the sound made by the hero's stomach. The young hero said he was hungry. The female beast man said that if that's the case, she would show her abilities and they would be able to thank her and pay the fee. He asked Yuru to help him and Muir said he would help too. Here, he opened his eyes to what he saw in front of him. The woman said it to make the meat of clover rat delicious. She prepared a sauce for it and added sweet and slightly salty rice. Thank you for the food and started eating. R told Arnold to take a look. She said it when Yuru was there. She looked like an angel. Arnold replied that she was wrong and the girl next to her looked more like an angel. The woman asked them not to make too much noise, saying that they both were cute. She asked if there were any more questions. Rav said that tenderness is justice, and Arnold claimed that Muir and Uru were both angels. Uru turned to the hero and said that he was strong and cool. She asked if she should be his bride. 
Muir asked nervously if it was still too early for her to become a bride. She answered that she was her mother's bride, so when she grew up she would become an extraordinary woman. She shouted for him to wait. Rav asked Arnold what he should do to keep Yuru away from the hero. Arnold told her not to worry because they would leave soon so his daughter would be fine. He stated that the only one who should worry was him because he traveled with her and admitted that he was jealous of the hero who reflected the hero in the book. It's a shame, of course, but he was a delicious food field. So here's the replacement that can be accepted, they said goodbye to each other. Arnold asked the hero to speak for a moment. He asked if he would really stay with them. The hero wondered what he meant. Arnold explained that with what happened, they caught the attention of the beastmen in the cage, so they would chase them. He said they could run faster than them and attack them at the border. Crossing it would cause problems. He added that it was their mistake to get involved in all this and admitted that he felt ashamed. The hero replied that he didn't care. He said he didn't like blaming others because he decided for himself and he provided for the possibility of persecution. The hero added that he told him that he was heading towards the border, so this journey would be a very good reward for him. Arnold was moved by the hero's words and asked the young man why he was whining and offered to hit the hero. The hero's street reflected the same task of helping him in difficult situations, and if they broke up, it would only happen when they became equal. He decided that such a journey should not be boring. He heard someone want him to say something here, while bowing and saying he regretted what happened. He thanked him for saving him. He told him not to worry. He remembered that he forgot and put his hat on his head. The girl panicked thanks to him. The hero knelt down and tapped his forehead. He said if he was very worried, then let him go stronger. In the Mount of Raji, they bathed in hot springs. Someone's spring fell into the water, causing Arnold and Muir to be surprised. Arnold asked if this was a man. Muir answered that no matter what, they had to get her out and make sure of it. And he agreed with Arnold with a smile on his face, gently touching her face, telling her to wake up. Muir called her with a questioning tone. And the hero asked if this was a crime happening to the hero, deciding to use his magic and woke up and wondered if it was suitable for that girl. The girl woke up suddenly and bit her hand for everyone after she woke up. The girl apologized for biting her hand and turned to the hero, and he answered that she shouldn't have called him so familiarly and called her Antenna Girl. The girl introduced herself to them and said that her real name was Winka, but they could call her Wee. They asked Wee if she was traveling alone and the girl answered that it wasn't her who was looking for the person, almost wondering if it was a dagger. She answered that it was a spear called the Virgin Victory and made it again. Former Muir claimed that this was unbelievable and asked who did it. He answered that it was his father and asked again if it was the father who did it, and she confirmed it. As the hero asked if his parents were beastmen and noticed that he didn't look like them, he asked if it was his relative, and she answered that it was indeed so. Arnold explained that she resembles her mother. Arnold said that Y is a half-bred. He asked if it turns out that he is a half-bred. Then he would not have animal ears. Arnold replied that it's not like that at all. He explained that a mix means human blood and beastmen. A child resembles human parents, but when born as a beastman, their whole body will become like that of an animal. He asked if they are afraid, and you asked again. He explained that when he told about their beastmen blood, they were afraid and called him a monster. The hero asked why there is a taboo, and Arnold replied that he would not be able to use magic and martial arts developed by the race. He explained that each race cannot do something that others can, and manifesting their demonic creatures is considered taboo. Arnold smiled, showing his tail and tilting his ears, and said that he is not afraid at all because he and Muir are beast men. He turned around and said he was hungry and demanded Arnold to call him bad, quickly take him upstairs. Arnold started shouting and demanded that he stop calling him that. Arnold took a crab and said it had been found. The hero communicated to Arnold, asking if he said the find was one of the good signs. Arnold said that it was a scary crab creature and they rarely go into the water, and moreover, they have very good camouflage. He admitted he didn't think they would find it easily. The hero was not happy and asked what they should do. Arnold then said they would use his magic to kick it right into the water. Arnold was completely soaked, swearing the hero assumed that this was a bonus incident with the beast men's den, and asked if it was true. 
Arnold answered that it was, and the hero asked if he should catch his prey himself. Arnold agreed, saying it would be faster and more reliable. Suddenly he realized that the hero was scared of something coming out of the water and threw Arnold up. The hero asked if it was the leader of the crab cows. Arnold shouted that it was a group of crabs. The hero asked what this meant, and he explained that when crab cows were scared, they gathered and used their camouflage to look like a crab. Arnold said that one was hiding in the river when he fell there and convinced them that they had no choice but to fight. The hero cynically replied that it was like a mountain and told Muir and Wee that they would come down. Wee ran past him and he called her Antenna Girl. He cut off her claw and declared that she would help him become a hero. He told the Antenna Girl and the old man to leave if they didn't want to get hurt. He stated that now he would finish him off with his great magic. And it was happening. Why did the hero ask if he used fire magic? Arnold replied that he didn't know anything about it. He explained that the hero didn't say any powerful words, but just drew some incomprehensible words and much more beyond his understanding. This was a unique magic that the hero said was extraordinary. He asked him with great interest if he had used oil, and he agreed. He explained that he could smell it. The hero asked him if something had happened. Arnold replied that something was bothering him. He explained that there should be no one among the races who have a better sense of smell than a dog. He said that Y did not belong to the dog race. The hero asked if there was something similar, before Arnold said that these were the three great beast men races, but they belonged to mythical animals whose ancestors were their grandparents. He said one of them was the golden fox. There was a special case when they inherited the nine-tailed traits, and they could freely change their bodies. Arnold cooked food and asked Wee if he started his journey at the age of seven. He asked how old she was now, and he answered unsure that he was fourteen years old. He asked Wee if she started the quest alone. She answered that she did. She said she was with someone, but they preferred to leave when they heard his story with a big smile, admitting that this was the reason finding someone who accepted him made him very happy. Arnold considered the smile very beautiful. The hero adjusted his glasses and thought about it, saying that she was not the only hard-working person, and yet there was something he liked about him, deciding how she should live differently.